everyone. Welcome back to the Doctor Will See You Now. And what I'd like to say is a rather special Doctor Will See You Now because we have with us uh, an author who is now the proud owner of the Goldsboro Books Glass Bell Award for 2021. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Claire Whitfield into the consultation room. Good afternoon, Claire. How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm great, obviously, since I'm an award winner. So <laughs> like, I'm super excited and I'll probably never get over it, but I very well thank you. Mm, good stuff, good stuff. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for bringing to us People Have Abandoned Character. What a gorgeous book it is as well. Um, outside and inside, well, gorgeous. Mm but certainly riveting uh, and, and an exploration of character and taking us to a place that some of us might be familiar with, but um, giving us a very fresh perspective on that story and that time. Um, so I'll, I'll just, you know, well, I wonder, rather than me do it, because this is your book, it's not mine, could you give us sort of like the premise of people of abandoned character? Yeah, so um, our protagonist, the main character, Susanna, she is a spinster and she's really lucky to be a ambitious woman for her stature. She's, you know, working class. Um, she is alive and of age at the time of the nursing reforms um, at London or the London Hospital in Whitechapel mm -hmm. and she takes up the challenge which hundreds of women tried to and becomes a nurse because she wants to have a, a skilled um, wage and you know a trade and the independence and freedom that that brings so she becomes a nurse but um, without giving anything away, she has a bit of a tragedy and um, she's quite jaded, I would say, by her experiences at the hard end of the coalface in Whitechapel in, as a nurse. And she is romanced, goes through a whirlwind romance with a younger doctor at the hospital who fixates on her and she he's wealthier and she thinks you know what maybe maybe I should jump into marriage maybe you know love does conquer all so she takes that chance on this relationship and is very confident in that relationship he's younger he's wealthier but she's going to have economic um security which is something you know you can't underestimate the Victorian era was a mm. very precarious time and she loves him and he loves her. But as soon as they marry, his attention begins to wane. She feels he's boring of her. Um, she has to share the house with his overbearing housekeeper, Mrs. Wiggs, who has known him since childhood. Um, and she can't really get a footing. And there's a lot of imposter syndrome. And She's really, really struggling to adapt to her new wife, which is one of captivity, really, as a Victorian housewife after mm. having a job, a very active job. And she's struggling to find a feet. And um, just at the same time, these murders start happening um, around where they used to work. And he still works, the Royal um, London Hospital. And they become known as the Whitechapel murders. And she starts to think or suspect that there's more than a possibility mm -hmm. that her husband could be that murderer. Mm. And it's really spirals from there, really. Mm. So you take us to Victorian London and you tell us a woman's story, a woman's experience of the time and that backdrop of those Whitechapel murders. And, and I just, well, I have two questions. First of all, what got you into writing, okay? And secondly, what took you to this time where, you know, we might say it's, it's a well-trodden path, but it didn't put you off. Okay, what got me into writing? I don't actually know. I couldn't tell you a pinpoint. I mean, I've always loved the written word. I've always read but I've, I've 
sort of it took me a long time to warm to fiction because fiction where I came from was my mum reading romance novels which I hated mm -hmm. And, and it was kind of like my mum and my older sister's things. They would read like lots of Catherine Cookson and it was yeah. always like that sort of thing. So that was fiction for me or it was school and it was lots of, I don't know, cider with Rosie or something like that. Um, so I never really got into that, but I was quite addicted to non like nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know, I just sort of progressed into it. And then when I got to university, I started to take script writing as a module. Mm -hmm. And everyone said I should do it. Everyone said, you know, you've got to keep doing this. You've got to keep doing this. Um, and I didn't because you never do. And I needed to grow up. Um, but I did become a copywriter because I really loved enjoying working with words. Mm -hmm. And then I found that advertising and marketing is the most uncreative, creative mm -hmm. industry, whatever it's soul destroying. So I dropped that and, and worked in marketing and became a buyer. And then life got in the way. And then when my daughter was about, I'd say about 10, I started to do adult education lessons at um, local college doing creative writing workshops. Yeah. Yeah. And then I just started doing that for fun, really, and trying to get into it. And it sort of spiralled from there. Wonderful. Wonderful. That. What a path to this. This is what I, I love. This is what I love, though, that you never know where a book, the origins of a book and how it comes into being. I think, you know, the, the forensics of, you know, when we get to touch a book or, or you know, or on the screen, how did that you know it's, it's almost like you know a, a baby you know this, where, where is this gorgeous oh, yeah. I refer to it as my book baby I'm like it's more important than like anything else it's like my book baby and I say to my daughter it's my second child so you need to be nice <laughs> to the second child um, in regards to the second question and Jack the Ripper mm -hmm. you are correct that was like I have always been a sad child in terms of nerdy and really addicted to facts and loving research I would hang out in a library and just look at the books for hours um but I was very gothy and so like in terms of serial killers I always said serial killers would be my mastermind subject if I had to mm -hmm. um, so Jack the Ripper I would go nowhere near because for all the reasons you said it's so well trod so famous why would a debut author go anywhere near that but in all honesty it kept coming up at a workshop idea and it always got a really strong reaction and mm -hmm. um, we had to do a writing exercise at that educate as our education class and the exercise was right in response to a newspaper from 1888 about the first murder and everyone had to write from a POV, but it couldn't be a victim and it couldn't be a policeman. Mm. And I thought I'd pick the next obvious one. But no one else had done the same thing. And everyone was like, oh, my God, you should really do that. And so it kept coming back. And to be honest, I really struggled for ideas. And I just thought, you know what? And this is on honest truth. I thought writing a book is like a mountain and I can't think about it. What I'm going to do is use this idea to exercise that demon and use it to get through my first book. Wow. Then it will go, and then I can crack on and discover what writer I want to be. Wow. I love the way you took that challenge. You know, instead of saying, this is insurmountable. I, you know, how, how am I? No, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the rucksack on and I'm just going to go up there and... And whatever happens, at least I'll know. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. But I have a tendency to do that. I like to make things hard for myself, as my husband says. It's like, I can't, if something scares me, I have, I'm more inclined to try and deal with it because I can't. Mm. And like my sister always says to me, oh, but you're fearless. No, 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 I'm not fearless. I'm riddled with fear. I'm literally petrified the whole time, but I try and make sure it doesn't control me. So I lean into it. Mm. And I think that's the best way you learn and grow. And I definitely did learn a lot writing the book. So, you know, that was my objective. Getting a book published was my dream. And it's gone way past what I put set for myself. 
It's beautiful. You've just given me goosebumps by saying, you know, <laughs> getting published was my dream. And I think, you know, and, and here we are because that dream is most definitely re a reality. And, and I think, you know, that just listening to you, you know, remind, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway, because it's, yeah. you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I am listening. It's good. It's good. Thank you. <laughs> so before the story starts, you know, we're on the pages and, and, and the, those, that, that opening quotation, which I'm always fascinated, you know, what authors choose and why they choose it and the message that, that is within there. And it's from the New King James Version of the Bible, um, it's the book of James, chapter 2 and verse 17, that says thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So creative writing, um, you know, born out of a prompt, um, but yeah, it begins there in, you know, in, in, in one of those oldest books. Why, why take that from the Bible? What, what was your, your reason for doing that? Um, because I think it's, it's perfectly captures the truth, I think, for me. Mm -hmm my focus group of one is that and, and I and I really struggle with what I see as a tendency with people and just society generally to talk a lot and leave it at there I, I, I find that one of the most fascinating and horrifying things about people generally is that not many times do we have this correlation to, between what we say and what we do and I think that if you want to be a writer, for example, then you need to write. You can't put things off and, you know, have this dream and aspiration in the distance because one day you're going to get really right up to the, you know, it's not going to happen. So whatever you have to do, start doing something. And if you want to do anything, it, you're going to have to take some action. Um, so I just think it really perfectly encapsulates that and, and takes the emphasis away from rhetoric, which... I know it sounds a bit um, contradictory being a writer, but, you know, talk is cheap. And I, and I think that is apt at the moment. And it's and I suppose it is a theme in the book, isn't it? Um, and politically, you know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of talk that doesn't marry up with some doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to keep that. And I think it was really apt for her as a nurse as well to become, um, you know, to be ambitious. It's, it's great to have ambition and it's great to have aspiration, but that's not enough. You need to start the hard graph. Mm -hmm. yeah take yeah take those steps and, it, and even you know even if those steps cost um yeah. or they might not be big steps to start with but not to allow things just to exist in in the ether and actually yeah, yeah to have outcomes yeah yeah so Susanna you know the, this this main protagonist um right at the outset of the book uh we see a young woman with dreams and ideas and and that in, involves the going to london the the city of of dreams um yeah. and i found that interesting because you know going back to my own childhood in the 60s and 70s and london was that place where people went to realize their dreams and I think yeah. I think to a certain extent it still is, you know, yeah, that, that that city of promise, um, and yet maybe, you know, the reality of that m might not be so. Um, what does for, for you yourself? What does London mean for you? Well, that's quite tricky because it is quite complicated. Because I suppose I was born in Morden, which is at the bottom of the Northern Line. I wasn't actually born on the Northern Line, I was born in a hospital, <laughs> like St. Kelly Hospital, but, um, so it was always on the doorstep, and I was, you know, really comfortable with the tube and all that sort of thing, but it was work, it was commerce, that's what it represented to me, that's where everyone worked, that's where everything went on, it's where everything was bustling and busy and and I loved the buildings and the architecture and you know it's just got that atmosphere to it hasn't it you know mm -hmm. it's got creative energy this busy energy mm -hmm. industrious it's where all the history is documented and it just feels like it's so packed full of energy um so I suppose that's what it's represented to me 
Um, yeah, and I didn't realise, and this sound, this is showing my own ignorance massively, but it, it's true. I lived there or around until I was 20, let me think 25. And then I moved to Southampton. And it wasn't until I moved out of London that I realised that the rest of the country wasn't exactly the same. It was such a culture shock mm -hmm. moving down here um, because I didn't drive for, like for, for one. So I was like, oh, I'll just get the bus. And they're yeah. like, uh, <laughs> no, you won't. Yeah. <laughs> There's one bus an hour and it runs like twice a day. So it was a real culture yeah. shock, you know. And then that's where everything is targeted towards and it's where progress is made. And I think people are naturally drawn to that, especially young people when they have their sense of adventure. <laughs> You want to go and do something you don't know what it is but you know you have to be around other people who want to do something so i suppose that's what it represents to me mm -hmm. you paint I, I i love the energy with which you talk about that space as well you know you can see it still you mm. know even, even though you know you're, you're located elsewhere i think it still has that that place for you that you know that place of, of possibility but let us return to the London of the novel uh, and, you know, and nursing as well at, at that time. And, and I'm just really keen to know you're doing your research, you know, that, that you wonder, you know, how did you get to that point of understanding what it smelt like, um, what it looked like, felt like, and also then the challenges, you know, for, for women going into this profession how long did you spend over over you know the research I love research you know if that was a job I'd do it you know if, if only I could find someone to pay me full time but I love it um so I suppose my problem is the opposite my problem is knowing when to stop so I knew she wanted I knew she was going to be a nurse and I, it was great because I kind of stumbled across the London hospital and stumbled across the matron, Eva Lux, who was a real person and who really was a confidant of Florence Nightingale. And they really did have this. What I learned about the nurses at the time was fascinating and I can bore the pants off you with this. But what I found most interesting, it was that before these reforms, um, nursing was not a very respected um, profession at all. In fact, there was no qualifications and it was generally almost a sort of another word for a fallen woman, if you like. Um, wow. Yes, it was quite derogatory. It was unskilled. Um, and the way that it got reformed and almost uh, rebranded was because, and I suppose there's a sense of frustration again, that, you know, upper middle class ladies started to get interested in it. So Eva Lux. Florence Nightingale and a network of upper middle class educated women who wanted to pioneer this profession for women. And the problem with women's salaries at the time is that it's, it's a bit like a lot of salaries now. You know, you, you could be the best will in the world. You could work all the hours God send, but you're never going to make enough to feed yourself and clothe yourself and pay rent. Yeah. So they really wanted to create this respected professional um technically endorsed profession so that it had a union they could work with each other they would have camaraderie um, and the way they cleverly positioned this at the time of great medical um advance mm. they knew that when nurses were involved um surgeons patients had a better chance of survival wow so what they positioned to doctors was that you need to support us getting this as a profession because without us you can't almost be the rock stars you want to be so the, the branding message to make it palatable to women and men who really didn't like the idea of professional women you know having a skilled mm -hmm. trade was that <laughs> nursing is the art and you know doctors are the science yeah yeah and these ladies formed this strategic messaging and they had um, obviously sponsors in parliament, they had brothers who were important and they managed to use that influence to get their reforms through. And um, when they did manage to um, raise the living standards, the rages, the food quality, the shifts, 
they even had at the London, I know they even had a house they bought so nurses could go and have a holiday. So, you know, these were real benefits to women. It was a career. Um, they, um, they were really protective of it and they had to be very strategically clever to make sure it didn't undermine what men were doing in their professions. So mm -hmm. they would stay under the radar almost, but it was so clever the way they managed to brand it. And that was a real education to learn because I never knew about that. I wasn't taught about that at school and it was fascinating. And then I read lots of nursing journals from the time, which are hilarious, um, newspapers from the time. I've got Eva Luck's book somewhere. She wrote a book, um, lectures on nursing. So that was good. Um, I, I went to the museum at the, at the London Hospital um, museum on the crypt I think it is it's like over the road and down there I did everything I could I, I tried to access it as many ways as I could mm. I would email archivists um, and see what they would be able to send me links to old journals it was I just did everything I could I, 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 and honestly I think you know I think this book just is is a massive testimony to the, to to that sense that that we're getting in in you know in this conversation of how much doing research means to you because the detail that's there you know this isn't something that that takes us you know like a bird's eye view of what was happening you take us through those times mm. and we hear those voices and and especially those female voices um it, it, it's it's a it's an absolute joy um seriously but how because one thing is to research a time and to gain understanding yeah but the other thing is as a writer to capture voices to capture conversations of then and and write with a victorian voice and not write with a 21st century voice how oh hello your kitty's just coming <laughs> beautiful it's a nightmare she is she she will start being annoying in a minute she's fine it's great Go ahead. <sighs> here she is look at this she wants to be part of it hello That's always when she hears voices and she wants mm -hmm. to be like attention what's she, what's she called uh this is kyra hi kyra she's she's annoying, just, she? she says i'm just fine here i just want to know what's going on she says, yeah, you carry on. I'll just listen. That's yeah. Awesome. So, yeah, finding that those voices, that Victorian voice, how, do you, how did you do that? How did you set about that? To be honest, I don't really know. I did struggle a lot. I mean, I, I had written the book at least twice over, mm -hmm. and then I'd read it and thought, I do not like the main voice and I think I was actually too preoccupied with being formal and Victorian mm -hmm. it was it was intimidating and I'm not Hilary Mantle and I'm not a historian and I didn't feel qualified to be able to sort of recreate with full you know into the minutiae what every word would be and I just thought you know what it's not about that it's a story and what I found when I was doing my research into especially with the nurses is that when you had accounts there were lots of different voices there and we have a tendency to sort of think of the people in the past as a different species they thought different things they didn't you know and that's what came through in the newspapers and all the research that there were women who were frustrated with their situation then they had the voices they were verbalizing this you know there were campaigners and moralists who were trying to reform things and they were articulating things we perhaps have been led to believe not by in, by omission maybe mm -hmm. we just didn't think these things back then you know and and that's not true you know women still need to feed themselves or have talents and potential and you could see the voices were there so what I thought I'd try and do is really be honest to her voice you know at the end of it all we're all people full of talents and likes and dislikes and instincts and thoughts and opinions and they all move and they all evolve and I just try to be honest to that but mm -hmm. character wise I'm quite 
I think this is quite common from the other author, authors I've spoken to, but they tend to come fully formed. I didn't create her. Mm -hmm. I didn't sit down and go, right, she's got to be like this or like that. She just kind of came fully formed. So it wasn't, I know it sounds stupid, but it wasn't like I had to be, right, what would do Susanna do now? Because I knew because she was shouting at me. She was doing it and saying it. Yeah. 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 Well, I, and again, you see, when, when authors talk about this, it makes me wonder, is it that there's no doubt that authors create but is it that what they really are is a conduit for stories that are waiting to be told? Yeah, maybe. And it's a sort of accumulation of all the things you've read and sort of little pinpricks of things that stuck with you. And then maybe like the character becomes like that piece of wool that gets wound around all the yeah. pins. And... Yeah. And, and, then it, and then it forms and, and we begin yeah. to see it. Yeah, yeah. Now, so if we, so, so Susanna and, and her life in London and then it changes because you told, you know, she, 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 she becomes that married woman and, and sadly for married women to have that profession to, you know, that was not possible. I, 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 it was with, with sadness, you know, to read the line that once she told you know, her superior that she was going to be married, it was like, you're fired. Yeah, that's it, job done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bye, off you go. Yeah. And it made me think, and, and I, you know, I know you've written, you know, this is historical fiction, but the strands that run through this book that just so resonate, you know, in 21st century Britain, at least, were you aware that you were doing that? Yeah. Yeah, it was That's a conscious choice, yeah? Yeah, yeah, because the, when I was doing the research, I was horrified and struck by how far we haven't come. It was like, especially reading the newspapers, if you ever fancy a laugh, spend an afternoon reading old newspapers because it's kind of hilarious and depressing at the same time because... They could have been written today. The words might be different. You know, you'll you'll read slightly different language, but the the common enemy, the scapegoating, the the let's create who to be angry at today. That sort of divisive rhetoric and targeting of people to evade some area of responsibility somewhere else is ingrained in it, and it was hilarious but really, really depressing. The people have changed, but the names have changed, but it, it just felt like any of those newspapers could run today. It really mm. did. And that really, really shocked me. And also there were a lot of similarities because if you think that the sea cable had just been laid under the Pacific Ocean, I think it is, and that enabled telegrams to be sent around the world within 24 hours. So before, when some a news story broke, it would, you know, it might take ages to get to the States, it would sort of, but with this advance in technology, there it sort of increased the thirst for content. And I just thought that, so the, the papers had to be more sensational, they'd get more stories. And then the, the, the murders, the Whitechapel murders were gold for the newspapers because everyone was horrified and scared and reading them and they had to read more and so, there was more content, you need more content, and then you change content for clickbait, and you start, wow, we're completely at the same point. And then you read all the hand wringing, the moralists going, change is coming too fast, you know, we're polluting people's minds, society is falling down, and massive wealth inequality, massive wealth inequality. So you're reading all this wonderful stuff about Queen Victoria and the empire, and London is the richest city in the world, yet, well, only for a few people, there's a lot of people. The best thing, it sounds really awful, that Jack the Ripper did was shine a spotlight on a particularly neglected area and set of people that embarrassed the UK. It embarrassed the empire into sort of admitting they weren't perfect because people were pointing from around the world and laughing. And I think, unfortunately, they you have the same people going, you know, well, it's their fault, they're poor. They've made bad choices. And then you have the church going, well, how do we help the children? 
because you know how do you st so it was just the same hand ringing the same thing and it just struck me that wow we've been here before haven't mm. we yeah I mean you could argue that and in a very simplistic way that that's all that's really changed is is the date here <laughs> because those, because those stories and and you know I don't I don't wish to take away at all from the complexity of this story as I say and 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 the clear research that has gone into to to, to bring in as a, a very different take on on the on that you know on that time and the stories but there was a line in it that that, that struck me we, we you talk about the, the those attitudes and the the native poor and how lazy and inept they are, you know, and, and Susanna's talking about, you know, like, you know, her background and how that wasn't true and, you know, and how she knows, you know, she knows how hard people work to try and, and make, make headway to try and move on, but that trap is just there, just as the trap is now. And who really cares and who's going to make a difference? um yeah do we ever learn do we ever move forward Oof. yeah and that that was really what struck me and the class system which i think is still you know i think more apparent today it feels like it's almost digging its heels in you know yeah uh, um and i don't know if that's the last throes almost of something dying i hope so but it, it it doesn't necessarily feel like that. If we look at social mobility today, it's gone backwards. Indeed, indeed. It, I mean, you know, it, it made me think exactly that, you know, as somebody who feel very fortunate to have been part of social mobility, to, you know, to, to have mm -hmm. opportunity, to, you know, to have possibility. Um, and, that, you know, I wonder, you know, I mean, talking to my students recently, and they're, and they're people at university, but like they they feel where do they go from this? What possibilities are there? You know, to, to even having had an education, what then is waiting for them? Yeah, mm. yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think growing up for me, I had very two different parents. My mum was northern, um, and she was very. Um, I think she was literally a communist, actually. <laughs> It was very, you know, it's and and she she did support me to go to university because my dad didn't want me to go and he was like, it's not for the likes of us. You get in the bottom, you work your way up. Whereas mm -hmm. my mum was like, she's going, going you know, up. I'm yeah. having a child at university and I want that picture on my hallway, you know. And she it didn't it didn't kind of matter, but she was like, it's all about networking. That's what her life mm -hmm. felt. She felt doesn't matter what you do and it doesn't matter if you're good. It's about who you know and who you can be friends mm -hmm. with. And I just thought that was rubbish because, you know, I'm just going to work hard. And but actually, especially in the corporate world, I found in my experience, it really is about networking. And you and you do see people. I mean, we only have to look at our current leaders and it's definitely your chums, isn't it? Who are mm -hmm. getting jobs. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd have sympathy for your students because where's the succession? Where's the opportunity? Where's the reward for you know really trying hard what what can you see systemically yeah. Yeah. that will help you develop so mm. yeah and I think at the Victorian times as well but and, and it will probably do the same now I think that generally encourages um it's funny it would be if you were poor you'd be a criminal and a confidence trickster if you're rich you're kind of an entrepreneurial businessman mm -hmm. <laughs> it sounds familiar <laughs> yeah yeah, it's, it's, you know, people like Susanna isn't honest about exactly where her couple, she's come from and her origin story. Mm. And that probably, it deepens her sense of imposter syndrome and fear of being almost found out mm. in her new home. Um, but I think a lot of us have that. A lot of us, you know, opportunity is so scarcely come by that it swings by and you've got to grab it. And you know what? I'll work it out later. Yeah, <laughs> I think, and and I, I think you know this 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 woman encapsulates you know something that that we talked about at, at the start of you know here comes an opportunity I don't know how I'm going to manage this and especially when that opportunity begins to take on a shape that I never imagined it, it would 
but I, but I think you you know what you give us is is a character here that says I have a dream, and at all costs, you know, in in the sense of I am going to battle through this, and I am going to you know, I'm going to grasp this nettle because goodness me, you know, you give her one hell of a nettle to have to hold <laughs> on to. <laughs> I um, love people say that. Yeah, they are like, oh, <laughs> poor girl. Well, but but oh my, what you know? Again, what an inspiration. And uh, you know, and again, we can't can't say too much about the close of a novel because this book people should read this. But I think, despite its subject matter, I think it's immensely hopeful. Even the conversation that we're having now, yeah. of oh my, you know, the the, the difficulties in which we find ourselves uh, and society finds itself in Susanna you know in extreme difficulty there is hope yeah and she keeps going and I think you've really hit across something there that I really wanted to, to write for myself and for other people in that I know I do enjoy things like Marvel and superheroes and things like that I do enjoy it mm. but I don't find them very inspirational because I need to know how a person with just arms and legs maybe and a brain can figure out how to rescue themselves. I need to see someone maybe vaguely similar to who I might have been at any point be able to figure things out and move forwards just with what they have. And I think that is inspiring, you know? Mm -hmm. I love reading about like non-fiction about women you know especially like from history and you think wow how did they do that you know it's those stories are there and they're yeah. inspiring yeah yeah there's against all odds and if we can I, I don't want to dwell too much um on 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 the we'll call them gory bits um but I did want to ask you about you know you mentioned serial killers and you know being fascinated by that and when you went back to look at the stories around Jack the Ripper did you find anything that you know that struck you that you had not been aware of before because you might not have gone as, as deeply into it as you have to, to create this novel? Um, no not really not in regards to Jack the Ripper because that was probably the area of the novel I researched least mm -hmm. partly because I'd already read about it as a sort of angsty teenager with bad acne, rather a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I knew there was a lot of terrible books about it. And I knew there were a couple of really good books that mm -hmm. I was fun to. Um, trying to think, what, what did I learn about it that I wasn't? I think what was really amazing was I was lucky enough to be able to read the five before, obviously, the novel was finished mm. and like I'd always wondered massively about these women mm. so intrigued by these women how did they live and who they were and I have a really good book that did actually have some of their personalities and some of their background stories um but it was so fascinating to read about these women and their lives and how difficult they were and so I, I, honestly if anyone wants to read that book they should it's amazing um and it's really poignant you know but those mm. stories as well are almost like mini novels about real people and there's mm. hope in them and there's love and there's tragedy and there's poignancy and disappointment and they're like fully faceted people. It's crazy. So I'd say that the only thing that surprised me, no, nothing about the Jack the Ripper murders so much, no. Mm -hmm. I, I, the fact though that you, again, that you talk about these, these women um, and how easy it is for us to, and again at the time, and newspapers and telling stories, our fascination, and still it remains with the perpetrator rather than the person or the people who suffers at the hands mm -hmm. of this person. And here we are in times when I, I'm pleased to say I do think. I do think we're slightly moving away from the salacious glorification maybe of the perpetrator and yet still we are fascinated by who they are and why they did it and how did they get away with it and what what station in life do they hold what space within society do they hold 
mm. as, po as opposed to you know, and and in particular women, though I know I know it's not just women that suffer at the hands of of such people. Uh, though I think statistically, mm. I, I think it's it's more women than men that, that you know that that fall foul of serial killers. But that those people's stories are heard. Mm. It's vital. I mean, did you did were you really really keen that we should know about these these women? Yeah, purely from um, I'm not the most my my husband often says to me that like if I ever have to go to the doctor or anything is that because they're going to try and find your cold icy black heart he always says so <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite pragmatic about things and I'm not overly sentimental but I, I, again it's that thirst for knowledge I was fascinated how these women survived how they did mm. you know? and there's, it's easy to look at them and, and dismiss them as poor unfortunates which they were and you know and all that that's very loaded because you know that book the five definitely proved that you know that wasn't a given they weren't mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. actually that's not obvious but by god they must have been strong hardy resilient creative to get to those ages they did in those situations and that's the bit we miss yeah. and I, I find that fascinating again it's the same story it's about survival and what do you do to keep moving forward so you know it's unfortunate that it's terrible that those women were like you know succumbed to like the ripper as they did or were attacked by the ripper as they did but before then they had rather heroic stories as well really interesting stories really you know well-rounded humans and that's what fascinates me you know I want to hear about that I want to be in awe of certain people and how the, you know so, like um Liz Stride she ran her own business for a while you know that she ran a coffee house it's you're like oh and yet what is more interesting is it shocks you and then you start ah oh, I've just assumed it as well I've just assumed they're unimportant women easy to be dismissed so that's that's the thing I like to challenge because if I recognize it in myself, I know a lot of people will also be mm -hmm. doing the same thing. And I think we've got to get better at that, haven't we? That's the mm -hmm. thing, it's late assumptions about people. Yeah, yeah, very, very much so. And I think, you know, again, um, and I love the way these things are being challenged in, in, you know, in our way at the moment of, whoa, wait a minute, can we stop saying to women, you know, well, you know, if you will do this, if you will be there, if you're going to be, then, you know, so, you know, women of those times, well, if you are going to be in these situations. Yeah, if you are going to sell yourself, the poor woman has nothing left to sell. Yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 excuse me, because if society actually, you know, looked yeah. after people, all people, and then not be this divide, and then not be... Uh, those that are easily disposed of yeah, because yeah. we don't deem people certain people to have any value because what are they actually contributing yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, as I can say I think I think you take us back in time but I think you know the page has just come back with so many questions of and um, what about now and what yeah, about yeah. now because the yeah. other the other aspect um that that I'd like to ask you about is the whole thing of toxic relationships mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um you know and and again it's set back then but I could just you know so often we ask ourselves now about why didn't things work out why didn't I see the, you know why didn't I see the red flags what are the red flags yeah yeah what are the red flags it's all well and good calling it a red flag but can you give me a description of what one is <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and you have to go through it first before you then recognize them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, and so a relationship that clearly promised so much, you know, it's not long into the book. You know, we don't have to wait long for things to start to uh oh, what yeah. is this about? And yeah. why is it like this? Uh, and then and then the housekeeper. Now, so anybody, anybody who loves Rebecca will, of course, be thinking maybe Mrs. Danvers. And, and initially I thought, oh, yeah, I can see I can see this. But with Mrs. Wiggs, you do something different. Um, and again, 
please, people read this and see why, it, yeah, it's not Mrs. Danvers. Where in the story, when in your creation, was she there before Susanna or did she come after? She came after, definitely, yeah. Yeah. definitely. And I think, I've never read Rebecca, which I know is a terrible thing to say and admit to, but, um, and one of the reasons I was aware of that sort of formidable character, Mrs. Danvers, just from reputation, you know, you know, it's like a famous book and it, she's a famous sort of figure. And I thought, well, I'm definitely going to steer away from reading it now because, you know, Mrs. Wiggs is a very strong figure in the book. Um, but for me, this sounds really bad, but for me, she was almost a, <laughs> I had a lot of fun mm -hmm. writing yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Wiggs. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed writing Mrs. Wiggs because she's a very, again, a very complex character. But I think it's back to that story of how women can be each other's worst enemy. Sadly, yeah. That, yeah, you get that a lot with mothers and daughters. And there's definitely a bit of that story with Susanna and her grandmother and the fact that opportunities change, times are different. And most, you, you like to think most mothers or most older women look, at, I mean, I know I do, I look at my daughter and I look at the younger generation and I go, go for it. You know what? I never had the chance to yep. do that. Yep. Just take it and run because go for it. But there's a, a smaller minority of people that can't see that because it hurts them too much. Mm -hmm. They're jealous and they, they need to know that the decisions and the sacrifices they've made in their life are the right ones. And so they stop other women from ever achieving anything that they can't admit to themselves they might have wanted I think mm. and Mrs Hicks was my embodiment of that older woman who seems to hate you on sight for no good reason <laughs> and yeah. you're like what have I done yeah other than you were born at a different time and you yes. were able to take those opportunities yeah yeah yeah, I, I, as I said at the beginning, you know, this is this is a delicious read, but there's points in it that are just like, ouch, <laughs> as well. Um, yeah, but 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 so well done. I think you know that that when writing evokes those sentiments, um, you know, that it's not necessary, not necessarily this this feels so good, but that you know, but no, this feels really uncomfortable. Um, or, oh God, I recognise X, Y, and Z in this. Um, it's beautiful. It is. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, thank you. Mm, no, thank you. Um, I, 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 there's so much more that I. Well, yeah, I have one more question about the book because again, I want people to get in and enjoy it themselves rather than than we pull it all apart. But there's one aspect, um, and it's my curiosity was piqued by laudanum. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And I've never been one for. I, I I enjoy a glass of wine. I've been known to, you know, overindulge. I've never been one for being into drugs. It's never. I think the the feeling of the lack of control. I'm a okay. bit of a control freak, but I was intrigued by it. Seemed to be like the, the drug of choice. You know, by people who could. Could you explain to us the culture of laudanum? Oh, from what I remember from my research, yes. So um, if anyone does hear this and, and, and corrects me, that's that's every chance that may happen. But I mean, pharmaceuticals, pharmaceuticals and chemistry and chemists, you know, at the time, they're pretty much if it was invented, you could buy it. It wasn't hmm. like, you know, you had the advisor, the BMA regulating, yeah, regulating any medicines or anything like that. It was if it was invented and it worked and it felt good, you could buy it. Yeah. So people could buy these things over the counter. And you've got to remember at the time, you know, children, there wasn't really any child care. Mothers had to work, you know, women not working and just being housewives and looking after their children really wasn't a thing then. Um, so you needed to keep these kids quiet. And so there would be opiates in child sort of cough mixture. There would be gin. People would give their children alcohol and gin. Yeah, gin, gin, gin was the thing. Yeah, gin was what? Yeah. 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 Uh, and gin was really, really cheap. It was cheaper than beer. Um, so laudanum was a, um, you could get it as a, in a tincture. You can also get it as a powder, I believe. 
um, but she the more elegant way for ladies to take it as I read was tincture so you put a one or two drops in water or one or two drops in maybe a brandy at night and it again was like an opiate where it just well you know it relaxed you, you it felt you for euphoric but it was addictive highly addictive you know um but I don't think people I mean <laughs> Because it wasn't very clearly defined those days, mm -hmm. people did down on it, but it was almost a bit like smoking in the sense that, well, if you did it behind closed doors and in your own home, yeah. who cares? You know, if you, as long as you weren't clearly under the influence or stagger, like, like alcohol, if you weren't staggering around drunk at work, who cared, you know? So, uh, but it wasn't necessarily a class thing because I do remember reading some research about the Kent hot pickers or that the, the, they all said they were off their heads on laudanum but it was more a sense of class around how controlled your usage would be mm -hmm. so the poor would be off their heads and have no self-control they'd say but it was a matter of class that you know you could use your substance with control and measure mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and your and your standard in society uh you know meant that of course you could do that that you wouldn't be out of control that you would yeah yes yeah yeah so it was mm. widespread massively widespread wow wow do you know even in even in our conversation about a historical you know mystery novel um thank you i have learned so so much today about so <laughs> many things that i didn't know about that's fabulous and really grateful for the opportunity for us to be in conversation like this um can i say I haven't enjoyed you know, people of abandoned character. Can I ask, may we may we expect more from you? Yeah, I hope so. Um, so my next book is due out in June and that's called The Gone and the Forgotten. It's very, very different. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite scared about that, but I'm quite excited about that too because I uh, it's set in 1990s and it's set in Shetland. Wow, okay. Yeah, so it's a massively different feel. Mm -hmm. massively different feel I mean for me I'm such a sensory person also acutely aware of like the sensory sort of experience that I, I will always have to have a very strong setting where I place it but I like the story is what comes first so mm -hmm. The Gone and the Forgotten is set in Shetland in 1993 it's about a 16 year old girl called Prue and her mother has who suffers from terrible depression has attempted suicide again and as a bit of respite, she's going to stay with her aunt and uncle in Shetland mm -hmm. in the summer. Um, but as soon as she's there, she finds out that her uncle, who she doesn't know very well at all, she's met him like three times, she finds out that 20 years ago he was the only suspect in the disappearance of his girlfriend. Mm. That was, and the baby goes from there. So it's very different. It's very confusing. It's a story about secrets and lies because there's a lot of things Prue wants to know about her family. But her family is very much about generations as well. And I really wanted to examine, especially after Brexit, I'll probably open a can of worms here, but of after Brexit, what we think about the truth and how mm. important the truth is and how it can affect people if they don't know it in ways that we don't imagine. <sighs> I cannot wait um you know like no pressure but it I, I, yeah no it's honestly um yeah it just sounds absolutely fabulous um I I hope you know all things being equal I, I, I would love to be able to say you know next June please will you come back into the consultation room and and can we talk about that next novel um because I'd love to do you know that comparison as well of you know having created people of abandoned character to then look at this creation. It, it fascinates me, the fact that, you know, often authors, you know, people will write a series, um, people will write along similar lines, but the fact that you, you've gone totally different time period, totally different space, totally different focus, um, other than the uncovering things maybe and what do we tell and what do we not tell but that it be in very different circumstances so please will you come back 
Yeah, if you'll have me, honestly, I'm right there already. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I, yeah, I mean, it is a big risk doing something so different, but I really wanted to sort of, I've already got a day job to sort of plod through life. Mm -hmm boss doesn't hear that but you know I've already got a day job yeah, and yeah. So for me I wanted to be courageous and brave and write the books I want to write and mm. the simple thread that really hangs them all together is that they're just really complex female characters and they're good and bad which mm. is what I've been desperate to see because you know you want to see rounded individuals so hopefully it'll strike the same chords in people Beautiful, beautiful. Claire Whitfield, thank you so much for your time with us today. Um, no, and thank you. utter pleasure and just wish you all the very best. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Pleasure.